Roger, let me ask you a question. How 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 do you view India? The the yeah. DNA, the DNA. I'm not talking about like I'm talking the DNA of India. Who is India to you? I I can't even answer the question. I don't have an impression. I've never been there. I don't know. I I guess what I'm asking for, like they just did they just pass up China in total population? I think I just saw a report a couple of weeks ago. Either they're there or they're about to pass up China because the average age in India right now is 27. The average age in China is 38.4 years old. So oh, wow. China is getting older and India is getting younger because China, India doesn't have a, you know, one child family policy. India is like keep making the babies, right? And China is now realizing we made a big mistake. We kind of need the younger generation to lead an innovation. So India, Apple is now moving a lot of its manufacturing, chips, all of that to India gradually without offending China because China could fully disrupt uh, Apple's business if they turn on Tim Cook. So Tim Cook's, I believe Tim Cook is doing it very subtly and say, no, China, we're still going to make chips with you. We're just moving 25% to India. No, no, China, we're going to make chips with you. We're just moving 50%. If China all of a sudden thinks that they know he's going to move 100% away from China, I think China is going to make a disruptive move. But here's where I'm going with this. The U.S. companies are sitting there saying, where can we build the things that we need to build? Biden's speech, he talked about how in U.S. we used to make 40% of the chips. Now we make 10%. Yep. We saw a statistic a couple of years ago during COVID that the used car prices doubled all of a sudden because China was producing 80% of the chips. That one, Asia was producing 80% of the chips. I think it was China, Indonesia. I think it was like a few countries that were yeah, doing 80%. Taiwan. If you remember that statistic, right? We've all seen that. So now... The fear is, if we go in bed with India, what is the history with India? And again, I'm not asking because you said I don't have a, a thought on it. I wonder what... So, so for example, a carrier, insurance carrier I used to do business with. Big company, you know who they are. Very big company. They approached us. We signed a contract. Okay? We go to their city. They invite us down. I meet all the executives, all the C-suites. It's a great experience. We can do a lot of business together. A direct competitor of mine has a meeting. In their meeting, they tell them, if you don't drop your contract with them, we won't do business with you. Those guys were bigger than us, okay? The following Monday, a big player come to, comes to us from that company, the one that we signed a contract with. They fly out with their lawyers, and they said, we need to meet with you with our lawyers. The only time insurance carriers come and meet with the CEO with lawyers is because they're terminating the contract. Hmm. So I say, no problem. Let's go to my office. So we go into my office. I'm sitting there with my chief compliance officer, my, and a couple other guys. And you see this guy says, we're here to terminate the contract. I said, what's your cause? We just don't think this relationship's going anywhere. I'm like, very weird. You have to have, like, placement isn't good or this isn't good. In this case, we've had it where our placement wasn't good and we lost the contract. In this one, we didn't have. So I said, but I want to hear a reason. Now, I know the reason because I know the CEO of the other company gave a speech, and that speech, a guy that was in the room came to our company, and he called me, and he says, hey, just so you know, in a recording, in a, in a speech, this is what this person said to you, about you. So I said, so you don't have a reason? No, we just don't think this relationship's going anywhere. No problem. That guy who came and terminated the contract is no longer with the company. The guy above him, his boss, just reached out this week. He wants to have a meeting with me one-on-one. We're going to have a conversation, take it and sit down and talk. I decide whether I want to do business with this guy or not. To protect the relationship in the way we write up the contract is to make sure you can't suddenly within a week terminate my contract. you got to give me a two-year, uh, what do you call it, run rate before you terminate, right? The only concern I have is if America locks onto another nation to be our number one provider for chips or technology or resources – we have to be careful to not strengthen India in such a way that years later they become the next China 2.0 and it's 2035. Now India's is bullying America and we're saying, shit, mm -hmm. we created the next monster. So if you go back and you think about the deal that Nixon struck with China and what U.S. has done with China the last five decades, how different approach would we take with a country like India to make sure we don't turn them into a, another country that bullies us because they know they own us? Well, I think it would require having a president who says, perhaps we shouldn't be making our chips outside the United States. Yeah. Perhaps we shouldn't be making our most important pharmaceutical drugs outside the United States. Isn't the best way to keep control of these industries 
and to provide economic opportunities for Americans to build these things here. So why are we outsourcing them? Oh, is it because the labor there is cheaper? Yes, but the national security implications are are obvious. Uh, Add to that that countries like China, but specifically China, are systematically buying up all the natural minerals, like cobalt, things that we need to build chips uh, and to build uh, other technology. Uh, I think that this is where the policy of America first uh, and returning these uh, national security sensitive industries back to the United States is absolutely key. And So my short answer is I wouldn't be making the chips in China or India. I'd be making them here. Well, here's, here's a challenge, though, with that. Who brought Toyota to America? Who brought Toyota to America? Remember when we're like, wow, you know, competition in America is only who? GM against Chrysler against, you know, obviously same thing versus Ford and this, this, that. I was like, no, we should let Toyota in. So this is when, uh, if you remember Milton Friedman's old videos, when Toyota came into America, hey, let's let them compete. What did Toyota force Ford and other companies to do? Make cheaper cars and improve because Toyota was producing a good car for middle America. So we helped Toyota blow up into what Toyota became because if U.S. sells Toyota, guess what? Other people sell it as well. So we allowed BMW, we allowed Mercedes, we allowed all these other guys to compete against the other car makers. Who won? Realistically, the the U.S. citizens won because we forced Ford and a lot of other guys to compete to produce a better car. Fine. But, But we didn't stop making Fords and Chevys in the United States. Exactly. We didn't stop making them. But here's kind of where I'm going with that. I agree. Today... I have 10 engineers in my office in Dallas, but I also have 10 in India, okay? The engineers I pay here, let's just kind of throw a number out there. If they're 150 here, they're 50 in India. So so what they'll do is these technology consulting firms will come to you and they'll say, we can do the same work for you, but you have to pay 150. With us, you only pay 100 grand a year for these guys. So they take the split between the... The salary Salary. they pay them, which is a 50-50, they keep the 50. They have to deal with the HR, and they get the project done. So, hey, the next sprint is going to require 293 hours for this upgrade. It's going to cost you this much. The next sprint, and anyways, we do the math with that. So as long as um, labor is going to be cheaper in India, in, you know, other places, the capitalist is going to find a way to save money by using those resources. Because for, for Apple... To build an iPhone chip in India versus America, Roger, the numbers, the the person's gonna say, "Oh, you want to buy an iPhone and build it in America? No problem. It's twenty five hundred bucks." I don't want to pay. That's crazy. Exactly, because the labor is expensive here, but the labor is cheap in India. So, it, and then the alternative is to say what? Well, you can't build it anyway. It's got to be in America. Then the average American takes a hit. I can't afford to buy this. So, it's a very much of a tight cyclical cycle that we're all need this is why china knows america needs china right now we can't step away from them dramatically all i'm saying is we're leaving china that resignation from china is coming may take five years may take 10 years may take 15 years it's coming okay when it does we have to deploy it elsewhere for 5 10 15 20 years one of those places is going to be india how do we do that to make sure when we give all this business to india they don't all of a sudden become the next enemy we're dealing with 10 20 years from now that's the question. So I think I think kind of to go back off of what Roger mentioned earlier that Nixon wasn't necessarily the one that that caused China to become China what it is. I think there's a lot of mistakes along the along the way, and I think the biggest thing that we've learned here is that China can take everything that we have, but we can't send what we have to China. So as long as India doesn't just close off to itself, where it says, okay, we're gonna now take your Facebook and we're going to call it India Facebook, or we're going to take your this and we're going to call it this. Then, as long as you have some where there's a big open where not only is America itself a market for consumption, but also we produce and we sell things to Europe and all the other places, where as where China is, a, they produce for themselves and then they produce for the rest of the world. So as long as you're able to have it go both ways, then I don't think there's as much of worry of that as what we face with China. Where even if if you invest in China, you can't take the money out. If you do, all the limitations are on and the that, way and out. And that's where I'm going. Yes. And that's where I'm going. Then, then I think the structure on how we broker that deal needs to be in place before we deploy all this business to yes. them. 
Let's 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 put a deal together. Yes. Here's so, what the deal has so to be. So there's there's a really interesting thing yeah. actually that they did in Norway was when in nineteen in uh, December twenty third, nineteen sixty nine. I'm pretty sure when they found oil in Norway. Uh, what they did was that American companies had gone into a lot of other countries and basically just done private, bought the land, brokered a deal, uh, had the resources, and then funneled the money out more or less, right? But in Norway, what they did was they set up a structure in terms of, like you're saying, a deal of who's responsible, who gets what, right? So in this case, there was a lot of help and assistance from America where obviously ConocoPhillips, Shell, a lot of these companies made a lot of money, Exxon, you name it. But at the same time, they also helped educate the Norwegian engineers so that so that over time they'd learn how to do it. And the, the deals and the licenses were set up in a way where Norway as a country also benefited vastly from the resources as well as the private companies that came in to develop and help uh, essentially get the oil out of the ground. So, Pat, what would you put in a contract like that? What, what You know about stuff like this. What type of ironclad stipulations would you put in so something like a, a China doesn't come up come about where it's not, it's not too aggressive on our side, but, you know, make sure that this doesn't happen? Yeah, What's, I mean, you, here's, here's how I look <clears throat> at these things. I don't know is the number one answer mm -hmm. because I need to see the deals. But in if if I'm selling my company to his private equity firm, okay, and they're coming in, or if I'm selling twenty percent to him, fifty percent to him, fifty five percent to him, or hundred percent to him, right? You're gonna have twenty different uh, deals that you're negotiating, okay? Twenty different markers you're negotiating. Board seats. He wants three out of five. Hell no. You get one out of five because if he's got three out of five, they can fire me. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I don't care about three out of five because he's buying 60% anyway. So who are you to say, no, he can't have three out of five? How about we make four out of seven? I get three, you get four. I still have those three in there. Let's not make it five. Let's extend it to seven. Okay, I don't care. I'm still fully in control. All right, there's the price. There's a dollar. There's my commitment afterwards. There's a non-compete. How long do you want me to not compete? If I'm selling the company to you, do you have a two-year non-compete, five-year non-compete, 10-year non-compete? There's 20 things that you negotiate, right? First thing I would do is I would go to the guys that I've done the deals with all these other countries and say, what are the 20 points? Let's put them all out. And I'm going to tell, tell me the history of the deals where we won the most. Tell me the deals that we had where they won the most and why. So China won 90% to the point of us winning. They won a lot. And we gave them way too much control. COVID exposed the hell out of how much U.S. relied on China to even make the shots, the vaccine. All this, it was just a very ridiculous thing that COVID exposed on how much China won. Once you get those things, then you sit there and say, hey, India, here's what we're willing to do. If not, guess what you do? Well, whether you do it or not, we're going to let Apple produce the stuff here. Really? No problem. Anything Apple sells that's made in India, it's going to be a 25% tax on, uh, on Apple. Go ahead. Yeah. So forget about putting it on you. We're going to put it on Apple so they can't come to India. Oh, you can't do that. That's our number one customer. No shit, it's your number one customer, but they're out of America. Mm -hmm. So let's have this kind okay, okay, America, I understand what you're saying. Of course you understand what I'm saying. Let's do a deal where long-term you understand we brought this business to you. Wait a minute, Pat. Who wrote your, your remarks? Was it Donald Trump? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's, I was, I was going to say Pat 2024. Yeah. No, <laughs> but, but by the way, that's what was attractive about him yep. doing the deals with the people that he did. Do you know who speaks like that? Do you know who speaks like that? Who speaks like that? Operators. A person who runs a company, a person who operates a military, a person who operates a team. A person who's in it that's dirty, ugly, nasty. Not a politician. They don't speak like that. Because politicians are like, yeah, I got you a deal. Yeah. I got you a deal. Yeah. Don't worry about it. I'll see uh, at the country. What he always used to say is that uh, <laughs> the other countries send, send killers to the negotiating table. We send social workers. Yeah, you're right. Uh, and he, this goes all the way back to 1988 where he's saying, wait a minute. Uh, I'm, I'm for free trade, but I'm also for fair trade. Your markets have to be open to our products as well as vice versa. Uh, and this is also why he opposed these one-size-fits-all trade agreements uh, in favor of doing an individual deal with Germany and a different individual deal with France and an individual deal with any nation, uh, which makes a lot more sense, rather than this one-size-fits-all, TPP, uh, and so on. So uh, I think it's about reciprocal rights. I mean, you would not want to put yourself in a situation vis-a-vis, -vis, say, India, where we're moving jobs and business there, but their markets are closed to our goods and services. Oh, Roger, 
uh, I've been in the financial business for 20 years. There's insurance companies who go to on their floors, all the engineers. I'm not going to name them, but I've been to most of them. I say, yeah, we got 300 engineers here. Really? Yeah, what are you recruiting from, MIT? Nope, IIT. IIT? Yeah. What's IIT? Where's IIT based out of? India. IIT is officially a better school at producing engineers than MIT. I don't know if you've ever seen this uh, exercise they did. <laughs> it's, it's pretty epic. They take a battery, a wire, and all these basic things, and they go to an MIT Institute graduate, and they say, hey, here, put this together. They're like, oh, I, I don't know how to do this. Then they go and do the same thing at an IIT Institute graduate. Here, put this here. Oh, this is easy. We learned this in our first year, and they put it together. And then they said, as good as MIT is, IIT is passing these guys up. I spoke at their university in uh, Mumbai. I don't know what year it was. 5,000 people were in the audience, and you can see the hunger in these guys' eyes, and they're all about technology, you know, <clears throat> innovation, all of that. So I think these guys are going to be the next China. They're a little bit more reasonable. They're a little bit easier to deal with. Uh, they also have a history of issues and problems. Their enemy is Pakistan and a few other guys, yeah. neighboring people that they have. Uh, I... Uh, <laughs> Anytime a company, you would much rather negotiate with a company when it's worth a billion dollars than when it's worth a hundred billion dollars. I think U.S. has to start negotiating now before it's too late and they say, no, we don't want to negotiate with you. That's all I'm saying. So if you like this clip and you want to watch another one, click right here. And if you want to watch the entire podcast, click right here.